in 2 Chronicles chapter number 6. Uh, let me give you a little bit of the background for chapter 6, and then we'll just jump in. Um, in Israel, they had a king by the name of David. Anybody ever heard of King David? There was a king before him, the very first king, whose name was King Saul. But King Saul would not trust the Lord. He would not believe in him with all of his heart. There were times that, that Saul was put in, in uh, difficult circumstances of life, and he trusted his own desires, his own opinions, more than he trusted the words that came from God. And because of that, it cost him everything. He died, his son died, and his reign as king of Israel was gone. And David, the young shepherd boy who was thrust into the limelight, he became king. And David was a man after God's own heart. He was a man that God used in great ways, but he was also a man that messed up as well. And I've never wanted to be remembered alone for my worst day. I don't know, if, is that the way you feel about you too? I mean, the time that, that you really messed up and you want everybody to forget that day? But sometimes those days gather legs and people remember those too. Well, you ever heard of Bathsheba? I mean, all I have to do is say that name, and you think about David, who was abdicating responsibility, was not where he was supposed to be, right? Doing what he was not supposed to be doing. He was caught up in lust, which led to adultery, which led to the cover-up, which was murder, which led to taking that woman to be his bride to cover up the child that his child that she was carrying, which eventually died and affected David and his family adversely from that day forward. One eventful night would be a shadow over the rest of his days and a shadow even over his families in the next generation. As a matter of fact, he had a son who would have been king who did not become king. The, day, the baby that David had with Bathsheba from that adulterous affair died. But Bathsheba had another child who was named Solomon. And of all of David's kids, Solomon was the one that God chose to be the next king that would follow David. And David wanted to build a house for the Lord. Before that, it was simply the tabernacle, which was a tent that could be taken down and moved to different locations. But David wanted a permanent structure, but God would not allow David to build the tabernacle. He was a warrior who had shed blood, but he was also one whose public sin was so evidently seen by all that he wanted someone else to build the temple. And Solomon built that temple. His dad, David, had got so much of the supplies and so much of the gold and so much of the silver and all of those things he, he had stored up. But Solomon built the temple. In 2 Chronicles chapter 1, it tells the story of Solomon, who now is king. And God says to him, what would you like for me to do for you? And Solomon prayed a very wise prayer, a very humble prayer. He said, Lord, if you would give me wisdom that I could lead your people well. And God did that. Now hold on. It wasn't a box that Solomon opened that had this beautiful bow on it that he looked inside and he took it out and said, Oh, great wisdom. Thank you. It's mine. I'll wear it well. No. What God gave him is the same thing, come on now, that he gave you and I when we trusted in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and Lord. And the Holy Spirit came to live within us. He gave us a relationship of prayer. He gave us a relationship with God that we could hear from him. So Solomon could take his needs, 
his burdens, his circumstances, the people that were entrusted to him, and he could take them to the Lord and hear directly from God, the God who sits upon the throne of the universe, the God who keeps all the world in balance. He holds the whole world in his hands. He had a direct line from the all-knowing God, and he could hear from him. But that's the same thing that you and I have the opportunity to have. Don't think for a skinny second that God loves Solomon more than he loved you. God loves us all. He loves us all the same. The, the, the land at the foot of the cross is level. It's not for only the elite. It's for anyone. And it may be the, the beautiful lamb that has no spot or no blemish, but it may be for the, the, the mixed breed lamb over here with a broken leg who has scabs all over it. They're still loved by the shepherd the same. It doesn't matter our past. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all of our sin. It doesn't matter if we need a second chance or a 22nd chance or 2,222nd chance. We have a God that through Jesus Christ sees us the same. A needy child who is loved by the Father. It doesn't matter how many times we become the prodigal and run away. It doesn't matter how many times we give him a deaf ear. He loves us with an everlasting love. I love Jeremiah 33.3. He loves us with an everlasting love. Well, to Solomon, he said, I've given you this great gift of prayer. Now let's walk in it. How did Solomon know what to build? He knew God. He talked with him. He listened to him. And Solomon was given much, but unto whomsoever much is given, much shall be required. So God used this talented man, powered by the Holy Spirit, to build this house unto the Lord. And when it was all done, they began to take all the things that were in the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the, the laver that was there, the, the uh, candlestick that was there, all of those things that were there inside the Holy of Holies, they got to bring them into this new building, and it was going to be the grand opening. It was going to be wonderful. And Solomon gathered there together and prayed a prayer of blessing upon that place. He built a platform, five foot wide, five foot long, three, foot high, three cubics high. I said five foot. Five cubics wide, five cubics long, and three cubics high. And Solomon got up on the platform with all the people that were gathered there. And Solomon got down on his knees. I believe he looked up and he lifted out his hands. Second Chronicles chapter 6. And he began to pray unto the Lord. And he spoke to the Lord the way I'm speaking with you. He didn't bring all these religious platitudes out. He shared his heart with God's heart. And God listened. God listened. And God was there. So if you have your Bible, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse number 36. Here we're going to see how Solomon is praying God's blessings, but he's also, as the leader and the shepherd and the king of the people, he's also praying for the people that he is leading. Listen to these words. When they sin against you. Listen to me now. It's not a matter of if they're sin against you, but when. Because you're going to sin. There are no perfect people in this place. There are no perfect preachers. There are no perfect churches. It doesn't matter if this pastor... I promise you, I messed up a thousand times over, times more of the numbers than I could ever admit. But there's nobody in this room. Now, we like to look at others, and we can see the, 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 the guilt of them. We can see where they've messed up, and we can point that out. We, as Jesus said, we can find the splinter in their eye when we've got a whole great big log in our own eye, right? 
We're very good at finding the negative of them. What that tells me is this. We think we're okay if everybody else would just get straightened out. But this, this is what Solomon knew. This is what he understood. And this is what he's praying. Not if they sin. It's not a matter of if. It's about when. When they sin against you. Look at this, verse 36. For there is no one who does not sin. What was it Paul said? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Y'all good with that? I'm very good with that. He says, when they sin against you and become and you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, and they take them captive to a far, a land far or near. Hold on. Solomon, when he prays this prayer, all of Israel was behind him. They were one country. And as a matter of fact, under the reign of Solomon, the country grew more than it did at any time before or since. But when Solomon died, his boy, Rehoboam, became king. He was full of pride. And there was a group of people that came to him and made a request, and Rehoboam did not answer their request. And there became a civil war in what we called Israel, the people of God. And ten of the tribes of the north, they split off. And they became what was called Israel, and their capital was the city of Samaria. The two lower tribes began to be called Judah and Jerusalem. Where's their capital? Now, the city of the north Their king was Jeroboam, not Rehoboam. He was the king of the south. But Jeroboam immediately led them into sin. And God does not bless sin. A holy God cannot bless sin. And just because when you sin, God does not immediately strike you down, does not mean that God does not look at your life and God does not grieve. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, it tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, any any time you sin, the Holy Spirit that lives within you, if you'll listen, He will begin convicting. He's got sharp elbows. He stomps on your toes. It's not me that stomps on your toes. My feet aren't that big. I can't do that to everybody at one time. right? But the Holy Spirit knows just how to do it in a wonderful way. And the reason He does it is because He wants to see the life of Christ bloom and bless. He wants this to be there to where God can just amen and glorify. So any of those areas where we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will be there. Well, if we ignore God long enough, God will lead circumstances and allow circumstances to come in that will get your attention. Church, y'all listen to me. It's very important for us to listen to the still, small voice whisper of God. But God loves you enough to do whatever it takes to get your attention. Whatever it takes. So for Israel in the north, it was the Assyrians. They came in with their army, and they captured all of them, and they were taken away captive to another land. And Samaria became just another city under the Assyrian Empire. And as a matter of fact, the Assyrians were going to take over uh, Judah in the south, but God gave them another chance. But they send away that chance. So God let Babylon come in. I said that to say this. Solomon was praying, really a contract over them. Not if they would sin, but when they sin. And what God would do when he brought judgment against his people. So he says, verse number uh, 37, Yet when they come to themselves in the land, where they were carried captive and repent. Did you hear that? When when they find themselves there and they don't like it and they change their heart. Y'all ever messed up and cried out to God and said, Oh, Lord, I messed up. Lord, forgive me. He says, Well, when they repent, 
And they make supplication or pleas to you in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have committed wickedness. And when they return to you with all of their heart and with all of their soul in the land of their captivity, where they have been carried away captive, and pray towards the land which you gave to their fathers, the city which you have chosen toward the temple. He says, look, when they're there and when they repent of their sins and they come to you and they're praying to you, God, I'm asking two things we see here. When they come with all of their heart, here it says in the New King James and soul, but really the word there is the same word for their heart and their mind. When they change their thinking, when they change their choices, when God gives them an option, you can do this, and by the way, we choose wrong all the time. Or here's right, you have an option to choose right. Temptation. Mm. God wants you to choose Him where He can bless you. Satan wants you to choose Him where God will damn you where you'll feel the consequences of your sin. God wants you to choose His way because God wants to pour out His love on you. Satan wants you to choose His way where He can pour out His evil on you. When they come to you with their mind and their heart, their desires, their wishes, their emotions, when they repent with their heart, this is wrong. Lord, I must do better. I must choose you. Then hear their prayer. Hear their prayer. And it also says here, look, when they are praying toward their land. Why is that important? Y'all ever heard about this guy by the name of Daniel? Remember he was carried away captive to Babylon? And he's there in, da- in Babylon, and they, they make a decree, you're not supposed to pray to anything but the king of Babylon. Y'all remember that? And Daniel's like, no, I'm going to pray to God. So he went home to his home, and he opened the doors wide open where all could see. Listen to me now. And he faced the city of Jerusalem. He was listening to Solomon's prayer. He said, when they come and they repent and and they're praying towards you and they're praying towards your city, it's an attitude. I don't know where the throne and glory is. I don't know what direction it is. But my prayers need to be prayed towards the throne of heaven where Jesus Christ is. And I need to come boldly to the throne of grace where I can find help and strength in my time of need. So here is the money verse. Are you ready for this? Well, no, verse 39 first. Then hear from heaven, your dwelling place, their prayer, and their pleas, their supplications, and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Now listen to verse 40. Now, my God, I pray, let your eyes be open. Let your ears be attentive to the prayers made in this place. Lord, when they come, make sure your eyes on them. Make sure that your ears are attentive to their prayers when they pray. Well, Solomon finishes his prayer. Look in chapter 7, verse 1. Now my God, I pray. No, excuse me. Chapter 7, verse 1. When Solomon had finished praying, remember he was there on that podium with his arms lifted up, lifting this prayer up. And as soon as he finished praying, it says fire came down from heaven. Boom! He didn't ask for this. As a matter of fact, when you see the sacrifice that was given, 22,000 oxen, all those sheep that were there that were being sacrificed, when he finishes the prayer, 
All of a sudden, fire comes down from heaven and it hits the offering and consumes the offering. And the glory of the Lord that it used to be in the tabernacle, the glory of the Lord, the cloud, the kind of glory of God came down and filled the temple. Y'all know what the word amen means? It means it is true. So be it. Solomon prayed this prayer, and God said, Amen. It is true. The answer is yes. And just so they'd know, fire comes down and consumes it. I mean, he's down on his knees. You know what would happen if I was on my knees and God immediately answered the prayer like that? I'd have done a backflip right on my knees. I'd have probably found down, fell down startled to death. Somebody had to give me CPR. I'd have said, Lord, I'm coming home, coming home. It has scared me. But you know what God was doing? My eyes are on you. My ears are open to the prayers that are being pl- prayed in this place. And you know what everybody else, can you imagine what they said? Wow! They probably told everybody they got in contact with, you won't believe what happened today. Solomon prayed and God answered. Fire came down from heaven, consumed it. Listen, that is the gift of prayer. It is the gift of prayer that the Holy Spirit lives within, lives within us to make intercession for us. You know, um, when I asked the Lord into my heart, I had no clue all that God was going to do within me. But to know that He now resides within me, the Holy Spirit lives within me. And what Solomon asked was that God's eyes would be open, His ears attentive. And, and that's exactly what happens. God hears our prayers. And God makes them alive within us. So you pray. And the Holy Spirit enacts that. If you've been wise enough to trust Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be your Savior and your Lord and your Master and your friend, He will hear and He will answer. What a day that was. Look down in chapter 7, down to verse number 12. Some time had passed. And it says in verse 12, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. Has God ever come and talk to you at night? Does the devil come and ever talk to you at night? Y'all ever have nightmares? Y'all ever feel depressed at night? Y'all ever have all the worries of the world come and there's not a thing you can do with them except just lay there? And If you're like me, you flip and flop, right? You try this. I mean, I'm trying to do anything. Lord, let me go to sleep, right? Sometimes it's that way. Sometimes you just have to say hush to those things and ask the Lord to come in. Sometimes the devil will come and visit you at night, but sometimes the Lord will come as well. In my first pastorate, I was a young preacher, and I didn't know anything, and I knew that I didn't know anything. And I was literally dependent upon God for everything. And I, I, I did a lot of study about prayer. As a matter of fact, it's probably been the thing that has been the keynote of God working in my life for the last 34 years. But I, I got the privilege of hearing some people talk about prayer. and Henry Blackaby said when the alarm clock would go off, he knew it was God's invitation to spend time with him. Well, I didn't have an alarm clock set, but God began to do a work. And in my life, at 4.30 in the morning, God began to wake me up. Not 4.29, not 4.27, not 4.38. I would open my eyes, and I would see the alarm clock with those big red letters. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And it said 4.30, and I knew it was God's invitation for me to get up. And I would get up and I would go to the living room and 
I guess God can meet in different ways with different people, but at that particular point in time in my life, I would put a pillow down in front of the couch, pad your knees, and I would bury my face in the couch. And I would pray, and I don't say this with any way braggadocious, but an hour or two or three hours of God just spending time with the Lord. Now, I haven't done that as much. I haven't done that as much. But I will tell you, even in the last week, I woke up, guess what time the clock was? said 4.30. Not 29. Not 4.31. 4.30. See, God still calls me. And there are times when you're going to hear a word from God. Don't ignore that. It's not time to roll over and go back to sleep. If God wakes you up and you know that it's Him, it's because He has something He says. I kind of like to say it like this. Before my day gets busy and everything else gets invited into it, sometimes He'll come and just say, let's spend time together. Jesus had a pattern where it would say that He would rise up early in the morning and go up into the mountains to spend time alone with God. Well, here, God comes to Solomon. The Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, hear these words, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I set up heaven, and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, folks, by the way, it's not a matter of if that's going to happen, it's when. And when it does, understand that it rains on the just and the unjust. Y'all listening? When Hurricane Ida hit, he hit the believers and the unbelievers. 30,000 power poles went down. Sometimes the house of the unbelievers were not touched and the house of the believers fell down. Sometimes the opposite, the house of the believers were not touched and the house of the unbelievers were not down. It's level at the foot of the cross, folks. God will not treat any person differently. God is a just God, and He loves us all. Don't buy into the lie of Satan. But He says, when I do these things, just understand, if my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves. Humility is a very misunderstood word. Humility, we think of it as, being meek and being weak and I'm going to be humble and I'll just let anybody run over us. That's not humility. I don't know what that is, but it's not humility. Humility is seeing yourself the way God sees you. My sin, not the only sin that I have, but the greatest sin that I have that leads to many other sins is my pride. I've battled it. My whole life I've battled it. And I guess as long as I live, I'm going to continue to battle pride and the offshoot sins that pride brings me. But pride is usually seeing myself and believing in what I think and what I want greater than the will of God. And it's like, God looks at me and says, you think you're here. You're not there. You're here. You need to lower yourself. John the Baptist said, I must decrease, he must increase. That's a good word. But you see, sometimes God may say, you're here, Brian, but I think I'm here. Woe is me, for I am undone. And I live a, a man with unclean lips, and I live, live among a people of unclean lips. I feel like the gum on the bottom of, of God's shoe. I'm just a, a miserable failure. You ever felt like that? And God says, no, 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 that's not you. You're not there. Don't put, don't put my perfect down, right? Because it's God's perfect work of redemption in me. Think of yourself here. So humility is not thinking more of yourself. It's also not thinking less of yourself. It's seeing yourself as God sees you. Sometimes I need to lower myself. Sometimes I'll need to allow God to encourage myself. Humble yourself and pray. Church, 
Prayer has been taken to be this little 30-second to two-minute thing. We don't want it to be too long because we've got other things to do. This thing that we do over a meal or after our devotion or when we're supposed to. Sometimes our prayers sound like my sermons. You're telling God what He already knows. And you've said the same thing to Him a thousand times. But really, prayer is like Solomon did, just sharing your heart with God. There's no magical words. It's just the words that flow from your heart. But we need that time. Solomon didn't wait and build the house the way he wanted to and then came back and said, I messed up. God, forgive me. Now give me wisdom. Solomon lived a life of depending upon God. And he needed it daily for direction and help in his life. Now church, please hear these words that I'm about to say to you. When Solomon practiced prayer and humility, God honored. But when Solomon got lifted up in what he wanted, 700 wives, 300 concubines, don't say amen, say woe is me. Say woe is him, right? He was following human cravings and wisdom of this world did that get him into trouble? Would his pride lift him up? He started building things to other gods. He even built a pagan house to a pagan god to appease one of his wives. That's because he lost his prayer. When my people will humble themselves and pray, seeking his face, listening to him, not straying from him, Lord, I need you. You ever heard of this scripture in the New Testament? Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall knock and the door shall be open. And you know, you've heard me say this before. The grammar says it very well. Ask and continue to ask and continue to ask. Seek and keep seeking and keep seeking. Knock and knock and knock and knock and knock and knock and knock. And knock, and knock, and knock, and knock, and knock until the door is opened unto you. If you'll humble yourself and pray, chase after God with an open heart of blessing, seeking and turn from your wicked way. There is no one in this place that there's not something in your life that you need to give over to the Lord today. There's no one that has grown so perfect with God that you don't have an area of need. But it's not to be ignored. It's to be embraced. And it can be a place of weakness that can, God can turn into a place of strength. So, not looking down upon others or even looking down upon yourself. When should we repent? as often as we need it. Should be every day. Sometimes it'll be every hour. Sometimes it'll be repenting of the same things five times in one day because we need to turn loose at it. He said if we will do these things, He will forgive our sins and He will heal our land. But verse 14 is the one everybody quotes because they call that the verse for revival. But listen to verse 15. The verse that follows says this. God continues his conversation with Solomon. And he says, now, my eyes will be open. And my ears will be attentive to the prayers made in this place. I mean, we go back to chapter 6 and Solomon saying, Lord, may your eyes open may your ears be attentive God says yes my eyes will be open 
I'm watching. My ears are attentive. You're praying. I'm listening. I don't know that we fully accept this. But Jesus Christ, the powerful one who hung on the cross, hung on that cross for me. He hung on the cross for all the people of all the world, but he died for me. Seven and a half billion people. And he hears their prayers. He knows the hair on their head. He knows the thoughts in their hearts. He knows the wishes that nobody else knows. And yet, he knows yours. Do you feel flattered that the one who holds the whole world in his hand holds you in his hand? He's a whisper away. You know what I've asked myself? Why would anybody turn down such a great God? Why would anybody turn down such a wonderful, loving God who only wants to do that which blesses? Well, it's simple. They've got something else leading and guiding their life and they're not ready yet for that to move off of the seat of the throne of their heart. Because it's built for one. And either Jesus is Lord or something or someone else, even yourself, is the one that's Lord of your life. In the last 18 months, church life has been turned upside down. The world has given us their wisdom. The world has told us what we could do and what we could not do. What we should do, what is wise and what is best. But I wonder, in the last 18 months, let me just let this hit where it may. Are we closer to God? Or are we plateaued? And if we're not closer to God, if we're if God's not just doing a, a wonderful work of kindness, the question is this, what is it going to take to get our attention? If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you know the whisper to your heart. It's a whisper of love. It's a whisper of conviction. But God wants to move you away from your sin. He wants to separate you from your sin as far as the east is from the west. And you can't say, You've got to follow His will and His way. But if you're wise enough to let Jesus come into your heart, repent and confess, come forward and become a follower of Christ, He'll save you. But Christian, all those that are so sure of what's coming, did you Hear that from God, or is that just a word from yourself? Solomon did well when he had that prayer life. Solomon did very badly. Where his country that he prayed for split because he walked away from the source of his wisdom.